I'm a huge fan of him, and it's great that he's took time out for Master Chef to sort of be here and speak. He is a co-convener of the Scottish Green Party and he served as an MSP for Glasgow since 2003. Put your hands together for the one for Patrick Harvey. You should be glad I haven't cooked for you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Better. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you, and thank you all for, for being here. I want to begin by saying that I suspect lots of you have had conversations about this debate with people who said, well, they didn't say I, not yet anyway, but they're not saying no either. There's a lot of people out there who are saying I but. A lot of people who think, obviously, independence would be good if or but. And one of the I buts that we hear very often is, I but can we afford it? Can we really? And so I want to say something about the resources of Scotland. Because I think Scotland is a country that could look forward, could look forward to an age of abundance. It's something that's a difficult one for the Green Party because quite often... Uh, critics of the Green Party like to say that we're all hair shirt and self-denial and, you know, we're, we're trying to tell people that, uh, you know, we can't have energy and we can't have food and we can't have cars and we can't have oil and we can't have anything. And very often I do get people saying, how can the Green Party be on the same side as the SNP? They, they're just an oil party. They just want to burn all the oil. Well, it's true. We've got differences of opinion about, about resources like oil. But oil was the story of the 20th century. And Scotland has to be ready for the 21st. The story of oil, the story of oil is the story of the growth of the current model of capitalism that we live with. The development of the modern corporation owes a great deal to the age of oil, to the age when countries needed to marshal huge amounts of capital investment. And so companies, corporations had to grow that could get an entire grip on an economy in order to turn that oil into economic value. Now, it might be that in the 70s or the 80s, Scotland should have been well-placed to put the proceeds of that oil to better use than the UK government did. But that was then, and this is now. Right now, the oil industry is another bubble. The world has something like four or five times more fossil fuels than we can afford to burn if we want a reasonable chance, just a reasonable chance of handing, in, handing on a habitable world for the next generation. So the vast bulk of it's got to stay in the ground or at least be diverted into non-fuel uses. And yet the industry is valued according to the reserves, according to the theory that all of those reserves will be turned into profitable value. So what you're looking at is a bubble. And because this model of finance capitalism that's grown up because of the oil industry has huge swathes of the rest of our industry, the rest of our economy owned by the finance sector that is itself exposed massively to that carbon bubble, what's going to happen when it bursts? Well, what's going to happen when that bursts could be it could be re environmental wreckage that would make the, the last eight or nine years look like a broken piggy bank. Let's not be dependent on that industry, either for our energy or for our economy, when that bubble bursts. The thing is, though, Scotland is so well-placed to be ready for the 21st century. Renewable energy is not just greener, is not just lower carbon. It lends itself brilliantly to decentralized ownership as well as decentralized generation. Renewable energy is all around us. It's in every town, every city, as well as throughout our, our countryside and offshore as well. It's all around us. It lends itself to decentralized ownership in the way that oil only lent itself to centralization. And that centralization has left us with an economy where financial services are dominated by a tiny number of vast 
businesses. Retail, dominated by a tiny number of vast businesses. Energy, dominated by a tiny number of vast businesses. And all of us left dependent on them. Elaine, a few minutes ago, talked about a top-down political culture. Of course we've got a top-down political culture. We've got a top-down economy as well. The opportunity now in the 21st century, as we see the outgoing economic model and politicians at Westminster still just trying to put it back on its feet, it's time to get beyond that because a new economy is coming. We've already seen it in relation to some industries. Industries which are moving online. We're looking at, for example, journalism, where we're no longer becoming dependent on a tiny number of big businesses that control most print journalism and broadcasting. We're sharing information online, peer-to-peer, person-to-person, community-to-community. We're going to start seeing the same thing with education. If we can do that with energy, and Scotland really can, decentralize the ownership of our energy, and decide for ourselves not only how we spend the proceeds, because it won't just be a tiny number of multinationals that gain the economic benefit of our energy industry, but how do we apply that energy? New technologies are coming along as well, which will make far more people producers, not just consumers, producers as well, of a whole host of the resources that we need. Manufactured resources, food, energy, financial services as well, and sharing the information that it all depends on. That's the new economy that's coming in the future. That's going to be the basis of the 21st century economy, and it could be one of abundance. It won't be abundance in the way that consumer culture wants to sell you, bombarding you with adverts every day of your life. Consume, consume, consume. Judge your worth on the basis of the stuff that you have as against your neighbor. It won't be that kind of abundance. It will be an abundance of the things that really matter. Time to spend with our friends and family. Abundance of things like health. Abundance of information. We're on the verge. Our generation is on the verge of a moment when the entire population of the world can have access to the sum total of human knowledge at the touch of a screen. We need far more than building out the infrastructure to achieve that. We need also more than the economic inequalities to be consigned to history. We also need an approach that's open to these possibilities, that ensures equality of access to every part of the economy. Scotland is so well placed with an abundance of renewable energy resources and a long-standing tradition of the common good. It's been a neglected concept in Scotland, the common good. But if we commit ourselves, not just to voting yes, but for a real purpose, voting yes with a passion in our hearts for the resources of Scotland to be the commons of our society, owned by all of us, marshaled in all of our interests, not just in the interests of a top-down economy dominated by a handful of multinationals. Okay, all of this sounds a wee bit utopian. It's not a guarantee. I've never been someone in this debate who's told you to vote yes because it gives us a guarantee. I only ask you to think about voting yes because it opens up possibilities, possibilities that are closed to us at the moment. And if Scotland wakes up on the 19th of September and it's voted yes, the people who were enthusiastic and the people who were a bit I but are all going to have to recognize Bloody hell, we did it. We're going to have to make it work now. All of us are going to have to make it work now, not relying on a handful of big businesses, not relying on a handful of people controlling our economy, and also not relying on a handful of political parties. All of us in Scotland, I want us to feel that thrill, that chill, that moment of responsibility and empowerment when we recognize that it's down to us to build a better world. Scotland is so well placed for the 21st century, we'd be mad to pass up the opportunity. Thank you very much.